Okay, well, I have no idea what I'm doing, so I might as well start now. Um, no, wait two minutes. No, it's, I, I have four seconds left on my clock. So, so time starts now. Okay, so my talk, I'm, I'm Nick Whittison. My talk today is on understanding web APIs and Objective-C, or as you may have seen it in the, uh, in the timetable, as Ernestin Web as in Objective-C. Um, <laughs> I, I am Nick Whittison, and uh, just a first little disclaimer, this, this uh, talk may contain traces of internet. Um, yeah. <laughs> If you don't like internet, um, you're in for a treat. So, uh, yeah, a little bit of background on me. I am quite large. You can see me from very far away. Sometimes you can see me in pictures. Um, I have previously completed my undergrad and honours in computing at the University of Tasmania. Currently, I work for Secret Lab. I make uh, iOS apps and various different things. Um, today's talk will mostly cover these sort of things. Um, talking about APIs in general, talk about REST, about what it is, what it means, um, Coco, 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 Coco networking and U, as well as um, AF networking, um, or why you should forget the previous five minutes of what I'm about to talk to you later on. Um, okay, so some of you may actually not know what an API is. Um, API stands for Application Programming Interface. It's basically your inlet into the back of some type of system. So if you want to get to access to some sort of data, but you don't actually, uh, the, but the system is owned by another person, like for example, uh, you know, anything that's not owned by you, um, <laughs> you, you need some way of, of accessing the, the data or the, the thing that it does. So uh, an API is your way in. Basically, um, an example of this, could be something like an elevator. You have no idea how an elevator works internally. You don't care how an elevator works internally. All you want to do is get the stuff out of it that you want. So for example, you want to go to a certain floor, you want to go in and be able to press a button. Um, or if you want to open or close the doors, there's buttons for that as well. You don't have to know how the computer works inside the elevator that figures it out because you have an API into its systems. So, um, and, and for example, if if the eleva elevator had something wrong with its cable and the cable had to be replaced and they had to completely rewire the internal of the elevator, you don't want to have to figure out how to work out the elevator again. So um, these sort of buttons and this sort of um, interface into systems allows you, to, allows you to keep a uniform interface between the people who are going to use your stuff and, uh, and the things themselves. Um, unless you're so now you know what an API is. Um, I should probably talk about Web API because that's actually the, the content of this talk. So to translate that from API into Web API, it's really the same sort of thing, but with a, with a web service. So things like, um, things like Twitter and Facebook, which I'll talk back in a sec talk about in a second, um, all, have, all have ways of accessing their data, which doesn't require you to know about how the, the back end of their, their product works. Um, usually a Web API is defined as a set of HTTP requests which um, are laid out such that you can get access to the things you want or structure your calls so that you can get access to the thing you want um, or to post data or to do whatever you want. And I'll show you about those later on again. Um, so yeah, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube are all common examples of that sort of thing. Um, and there are many, many more web services out there, obviously. Um, and a lot of them have public APIs, some of them don't, um, depending on how big they are and whether or not they're, they're useful to have uh, APIs for. So, um, yes, this is an animation. Um, so basically, what I'm going to teach you today is how to use, uh, how to use your knowledge, uh, or what I'm going to teach you, to connect your applications using an API to these services. Um, basically to be able to either make your, make your user experience better for whatever your program is, or to uh, actually make your, your idea possible, depending on what you want to do. So this is a basic client-server model. You have a person um, that's really pixelated, sitting at a computer, and, um, and he wants access to some sort of data. So he asks the server, hey, I want access to, to something in particular. The server goes, OK, I know how to do that. Goes off, rummages around in its filing cabinet pulls out the file, and sends it back. Um, and that's, that's basically how, how the internet works. You ask for something, 
the internet goes off and finds it and gives it back to you. Um, a not so simple client server model is something that looks like that, <laughs> where the server has something, the client, the client wants something, the server has something that the client wants, and in this case, the client. Anyway, so, so back to computers. Um, so not only is this useful for things like phones, this is useful for things like computers and iPads, um, because what I'm going to tell you today is how to do it in Objective-C, which runs on all of those ones. But the problem we have is that um, it's, not only, it's not only one one type of computer are connecting to these sort of things. If it was, you could have a, a, a single interface and that would be really easy. But you need to make it scalable such that, that multiple sources can all connect to these sort of services at the same time. Especially when you have um, three devices times seven billion people, um, that's going to be a lot of things connecting all into, into the same sort of servers. Um, in fact, Twitter, Twitter in la May, March, March of last year had about 15 billion API calls a day. So if you extrapolate that to now, that's like 20 billion something, um, probably more API calls a day. And that is not a very small number. So you need to figure out how to structure your web services um, so that your clients, or so that the people who want to connect to you aren't hindering you as a service. Um, and so that's what I'm going to talk about now. And that's the design philosophy behind uh, structuring a web service, or, and this is, this is useful even to the client side, because if you know about this, you can figure out um, a little bit more about how, about why the, the APIs are structured like they are and use them better. Um, so REST stands for representational straight, straight, state transfer, um, and as I said, it's the design philosophy behind, um, behind a, a RESTful server. So what, what exactly is a RESTful service? Um, so RESTful services tend to conform to a certain sort of, uh, set of set of rules, kind of, where it's not, they're not hard and fast rules, they're just like the, the pirate code, they're more like guidelines, but it's, it's one of those things that uh, to be called a RESTful service, you have to be this sort of thing. So, um, and one of those is a client and server separation. It means that there's no, there's no linkage between the two. It doesn't matter how many clients there are, um, it doesn't matter uh, whether the clients get replaced or, or whatever, the server doesn't need to need to know what the clients are. There's a clear separation between the two, um, and that that means uh, that the clients aren't concerned with things like data storage for the servers because they never actually even they never actually see what the the servers use for for data storage. They don't care. There's a there's a real separation between the two. Um, Sorry, the, uh, and the second one there is statelessness. So the server doesn't keep a track of what the clients are actually doing at any one time. The clients figure out what information they need and ask specifically for that information. So that means that there's no per client load on the server. Um, so if you go back to the Twitter example again, um, if, if Twitter had to keep track of everyone's red tweets as well as figure out uh, where they were up to scrolling and all sorts of other, other random things, there would be a huge load on Twitter to figure out this sort of thing. Instead, what they do is they provide you the information and the device can do that for you. So the device records where you're up to, it does that sort of thing. The client side does, does that sort of stuff and that's up to you guys as developers to, to, to do that sort of thing. And it means that you can add as many clients as you want and it's not going not to hinder the, the server within, within reason. Um, and the, the next one there is cacheability. So um, the data needs to know, or it needs to be able to indicate to the client when it can be used, when it's out of date, and when it needs to be refreshed. So that means that if the, if the client is asking for the entire set of data every time it connects to the web service, that's wasting a lot of, a lot of bandwidth. Instead, if it, knew, if it knew that this data is all fine, it's never going to change, it's good. I don't, need to, I don't need to check for this again, but maybe I only check for tweets since the last tweet that I saw. So instead of saying, send me everything, just, just say, send me everything since this time. And maybe that's the same amount that you would have got back, or maybe it's probably going to be a lot less. So if you check um, two times in rapid, rapid succession, the first time you get a whole bunch of tweets, the second time you say, give me everything since then, and there's probably nothing. So, um, so cacheability is really important for scalability. And the last one there is a uniform interface. So the uniform interface um, is basically a philosophy that, that keeps the, um, as I was saying before, the, the abstraction between uh, what the clients are and what the servers are 
um, you, by not coupling them together, and uh, you can create a, a uniform interface that doesn't matter whether one changes or the others change, they can always, they always know that they'll be able to interact using this, this middle layer that doesn't, uh, doesn't change. And of course, APIs do get updated and stuff like that, but if a client um, uses a certain API, they know that's gonna be good until, until the web service deprecates, deprecates that API, regardless of any hardware changes in the middle. Okay, so given all this stuff, now you know about REST, now you know about client server cows, um, we need to talk about how you actually do this in iOS. And the first part is, uh, is finding the location of the resource. So this is one example here from Twitter. This will get you the, uh, the latest tweets from the public timeline. Um, and then after you know where you, wanna, where you wanna get it from, you need to make your API call. Um, then you're going to retrieve or receive your data from the web service. So the service is gonna send you, um, send you all the data that you asked for. And then you need to process and display that data so that it's not useless to your user. You need to play it, display it in some sort of meaningful way. Um, and that is basically what we're gonna talk about for the rest of this talk. So, um, the first one I've already covered. So finding the location of the resource, uh, going to uh, the, the, the one that I found there was the public, the public timeline, but you can find the information for uh, all the public APIs by going to their respective website. Usually they'll have pretty decent documentation on um, what you need in order to access a, a certain API um, and it's all, all usually there. Okay, so with that in mind, um, that's something that you have to do depending on on what you want to get to. Um, I'm going to teach you how to make the API call. Um, so the things that are required for you to make an API, a REST API call um, is a URI. So URI again, that public timeline one, api.twitter.com slash one slash statuses slash public timeline. Um, and then you need an HTTP method. As I said, there, there are a set of HTTP requests. So the, the design philosophy behind it is that they can separate out the API is into meaningful chunks also using these, these HTTP methods. So for example, if you're only ever gonna retrieve data using the get, uh, the get method means that you know, no matter how many gets you call, you're not gonna destroy anything on, on that side. Um, but using something like put may change some data or using something like post might create some data um, or delete will some, delete some data. Now, these are, not, these are not hard rules and some people use them differently, but for the most part, um, people are pretty good at mapping out the correct method to the kind of thing you're doing with the data. And the last thing in, in a API call is a key, um, optional key value parameters. So just like if you wanna go and call a method and you pass in a parameter, um, these are a similar sort of thing. They're key value pairs, you give it the key, you say, I want you to set it to this value. So for example, if, if to say back to the public timeline, um, if you have, uh, if you pass in the, the key value pair, uh, number of tweets and a number, it will pass you back that many public timeline tweets. And that's just an example of how, how you can customize your API calls to give you back, and, and the other example would be the tweet since whenever and pass it the idea of the last tweet that you received. And that's, yeah, that's how you could uh, customize your API calls. Um, okay, cool. So um, now it would be reasonable to think you know how to make an API, API call, but, but that is not correct. Um, nope. So we're going, to, we're going to talk about how, how to do that in Coco now, because that's uh, important. So how do, we, how do we use this information to make web, web API calls in Objective-C? Um, the, the first step, uh, if you were in Rob's talk, he went through this a little bit, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through a little bit uh, quicker, and then you'll understand why. Um, so URLs are stored uh, as an NS URL, which is basically a string with a couple other things in it. Um, you can create one sort of like that. Um, a request is something that embodies your API call. So it's basically the, the, the entire thing, uh, NS, mutable, so NS mutable URL request is uh, one that you create, set things for, and then you can modify certain bits. So in this example, um, we're creating a, a request with the URL we made in the previous slide. And then we're setting the request method to get and then setting the body of the string to the body of the request. Um, and then the, the top level handler that handles this sort of request that actually goes and goes out to the internet is called NSURL connection. And the NSURL connection takes your request and a delegate, so you set the delegate of where you want it to send the, the messages once it starts receiving stuff. 
um, and it automatically goes off to the internet, says, hey, he asked for this with this parameter, with this uh, HTTP request, oh, sorry, HTTP method, what do you want to do with it? The service then responds. Um, the delegate that I mentioned has to implement these four methods, um, and they, they sort of make a little bit of sense when you read them. So connection did receive response is when you say, uh, well, when you, you ask the server for something, the server goes, hello, I'm here. I'm just going to think for a second, and I'll, I'll send you the data uh, in a second. Um, it could, it's, it's also the, uh, the HTTP response that you normally get from accessing um, anything through HTTP. Um, connection did receive data is when the server starts sending the data, so it'll send it in small packets um, until, until finally it's finished sending it, um, just like how the internet works. And the final one there, uh, connection did finish loading, is when all the data has been sent, the server says, hey, I'm done, and that gets called. Um, the third one there is quite obvious as well, did fail with error, is when, uh, is when that gets that gets cold uh, when the thing stops working. OK, now that I say that, I'm going to tell you why. And it's still important to know, but I'm going to tell you why you should forget the last five minutes of that. The reason is because this is not something you should do yourself. That's how it works in Coco, but it's not something you should do yourself. Because it's, it's messy, and it's clumsy, and it's something that there are lots and lots of frameworks for. So it's. To save you a lot of time, it's a lot better to, to, use some, to use other people's work, stand on the shoulders of giants, if you like, and, and yeah, get the most out of, out of your time by not, not screwing up uh, or not well, by utilizing other people's time. And this is really choosing your own adventure, because as I said, there are lots and lots out there. OK, so the one that I'm going to tell you about today is AF networking. You can find it on that link there. Um, it's really, really neat. It's, it uh, does a whole bunch of useful things that I won't have time to explain, but I'll explain as much as I can in the, uh, in the time that I've got. Um, and OK, go. So it does block-style networking calls, which means you can, you can uh, basically set up your network layer so you pass it completion blocks, pass it failure blocks, and it calls those when you're done. So uh, it's really, really cool, and it does all this asynchronously. So you don't have to wait for the data to come back before you, can, before you can keep doing other stuff. It goes off to the internet, internet comes back, and you update your display when that's all done. Um, and then all you do is, uh, to, to do something is you make a call, pass it the block, and wait for it to finish. Um, and that sounds really simple, but I'll go through a bit of a code in my demo, and uh, we'll see how that works. OK, good. Um, just move to the other screen. Did I? No, it's fine. <laughs> Did I? What did I do with the record? Oh, did it not work like that? Do 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 um, and that, all we want to do is create something with a single view. Um, we're going to use the view to display the data at the end. So we're going to create that. Um, we're going to call it Twitter, Twitter something. Sure. Cool. Um, and I'm just making it for iPhone with all the other things. Saving it there. Now Xcode loves doing that. Cool. So uh, just like a, a regular project, what we need to do now is check the screen recording. No, it's still doing that. No, I can do this demo a bit later. OK, so first thing we want to do is add AF networking into the project. So we're going to go to the folder that you've already opened up on your desktop and uh, the pre-downloaded AF networking and drag it into the, into the uh, project there. Copy all the stuff in, and that's done. Easy. Um, so AF networking is now included in your project. It's now ARC compatible. So you don't have to do anything. Previously, it does say 
in the tutorial that you have to do it, but in tiny little print inside that section, it says if you're, already, if you're using Arc and using the latest build, you don't need to worry about it. So if you get a whole bunch of errors when you're trying to compile it, just check to see whether you want to use Arc or not um, and read that appropriately. Um, the next thing we want to do is add the class file. Um, and basically the way AF networking treats uh, networking is you can either make a single request just like you did with the NSURL connection, or you can make an entirely separate network layer. It actually, it actually guides you into making a network layer as a better choice because it means you can separate out your networking code entirely from the rest of your code. Um, and that's what I'm going to show you how to do now. So we're going to create a file. Um, oh, if you don't press too many buttons. Um, called Twitter networking, or Twitter network rather. Um, and it's gonna, if you notice, it's a subclass of H AF HTTP client. Now, that's a, that's a class designed to be subclass so that you can create network layers really, really easily. So you're going to do that. You're going to add that into your project. Um, and so we're going to make this a uh, singleton so that we can access this from anywhere in our, in our project. Um, so we're going to put a little bit of code in. So we're making a static, um, a static variable here so we can do that. Um, put in some code to add the, the singleton um, stuff there. You can use dispatch async if you like. Um, this does exactly the same, same thing. And you'll note in here that um, when you create it, you have to pass in a base URL string. So the, uh, the Twitter API that I was using has a base string of API twitter.com, and you can put the version number in there, or you can put the version number in all of your API calls if you want. Um, but that's, uh, you basically create it with a, ver with a, with a base string, and then uh, every API call you create inside that, that file will have that as a base, and you only have to put in the, uh, the second part, and I'll show you that in a moment. Cool. So um, after we do that, we've got to go into the header here and add some stubs. So we've created a, a stub for the shared network there. And this is the stub for the, uh, the method I'm going to use for the API call. So um, it looks kind of scary if you haven't seen blocks before. Uh, but blocks are basically just chunks of code that you throw around. And it's, it, makes it, it makes it really powerful when you can, when you can say, hey, I'm, I want you to do this, and I want you to do this when you're done. But you, all, you define it all in the same chunk of code. Instead of having to say, do this, and then down at the bottom here, respond, um, you can say, I want you to do this as soon as you're done. So that sort of thing um, is really powerful. And that's a stub. So we're going to implement that one now in the main file there. Um, cool. So that one now is implemented. If you have a quick look at it, it's uh, basically taking a completion block, so something that you want to happen when it completes all the download. Um, that, that has one parameter called tweet array, which is just the uh, uh, NS array, um, which will hold all our data. Um, it, it has inside, uh, and it also has a, a error handler, um, as is described in the, the method. So the basic way you use AF networking is by calling the, the type of um, the type of HTTP method you want on your own class, because you're a subclass of AF HTTP client, um, and AF HTTP client knows how to handle get requests, put, delete, create, uh, post requests. You can basically call on yourself um, the the type of type of request you want, give it the path you want it to, to go to, and add all the parameters in. So in this case here, um, I've added the uh, the status is public timeline JSON, dot JSON uh, path to that original um, base URL string we passed in before. Um, I'm not passing in any parameters, and on success, I'm going to pass in. I'm going to run the completion block that I that I hand in in the start of the method, and on failure, I'm going to run the the error handler block that we pass in at the start there as well. So cool. So now that that's done, that's actually pretty much most of our most of our network layer done, and that was actually pretty easy. Rather than having to worry about where data is and where it ends up and then where it's going to be, um, everything's self-contained in a nice little file, which is good. Um, cool. So after we do that one, we're going to head over to our view controller and start implementing something that actually calls that code. Um, so we're going to add a small data model into our view controller. 
just so that we can store something as it uh, uh, for, for later on when we want to display it. And then in the, uh, in the main file here, we're going to import the, uh, the Twitter network that file that we just created, so importing that network layer. Um, and add some code that calls the uh, calls that network code we just created. So this um, this call to DW Twitter network shared Twitter network here. What it does is if the singleton doesn't exist, it creates it, um, and if it does exist, it just passes back the one that already exists. So it's only ever the one the one network layer. You say, hey, get public timeline with the completion handler um, this block here. So this this block that I've created right here, and it'll pass in a tweet array when it gets called, um, which I'm going to print out and then store into our little model that we've created. And if that doesn't work, then the error handler is going to go off. Um, cool. So once that is done, um, we're going to run that and see how much it can break. <laughs> do, 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 do. So with any luck, what we should see is a whole bunch of data coming out um, in the, the NS log there. And there we go. So that is Twitter. Yay. <laughs> yeah, it looks a lot like Twitter as well. So um, <laughs> except for less, less pictures of breakfast. So um, with that, that's, that's basically asking the web service and grabbing back a whole bunch of data. Um, but I'll talk about why that's not useful in a minute if it's not already apparent. Oh, oh, it's done. Sweet. It's going to be like screen court inception. <laughs> and go. Yes. Okay, so as you saw, AF networking is an easy self-contained network layer. It allows you to to separate out your networking code into something that's manageable. And it means that you, if you need to, to change the base URL because you're using a, a staging server or using a test server, you can completely set up all of your code and then just change the server in one line. So that's pretty fun. Um, and because your, your network layer is a subclass of AF HTTP client, um, it's clean and it's simple. And it's reusable. Um, cool. So let's have a look at this. Awesome. So um, now we've made the API call, um, and we've received the data. So that's all good. Um, so uh, Anvil animations. Unfortunately, the problem we had, you couldn't see it, but the data actually looked a little bit like that. Um, that's what 20, 20 tweets worth of, uh, worth of, worth of tweets look like. Um, I can't read that. That's good. Um, one tweet looks a little bit like this. Um, which is still still unmanageable because that's actually not what you want to display to a person because a person won't like that because um, that's a very very long set of words um, <laughs> and people don't know how to people don't know how to understand that. Um, it also comes in a funny language, so so that when when you asked for that uh, when you asked for that that timeline, it came down in a form called JSON um, and. JSON is inherently not English, so, so it means that if you want to display something, you need to figure out how to speak JSON before, or your app needs to figure out how to speak JSON so that you can convert that to something that people can see. Um, and to do that, you need to figure out what JSON is. Um, so JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation, and it's a, a really lightweight format, kind of like XML, um, that, that allows you to represent data in, in a really concise way. Um, it, JSON has a thing called an object. It also has other things. Um, but this, an object looks a little bit like this. Starts off with a curly brace, has a string, which is a key, pretty much like a key value pair, um, exactly like a key value pair. Um, a string, a colon, and a value. A value can be anything like another object. It can be another string. It can be a number. It can be true, false, null, um, or even an array. Um, an array looks a little bit like this. Um, so array starts off with a square bracket. Um, has a value in the middle, which, as I said, as I said, is um, is can be like an object or another array or anything like that. Um, and so, 
So what, what we need to do is use the, use the tools that we have to convert this JSON into something we can read. And luckily enough, AF networking has a little bit of magic built into it. And um, it lets you magically convert all this JSON into, into um, NS, NS object equivalents. So, and a, a JSON object turns into a dictionary, because as I said, it's just key value pairs. Um, an array turns into an NS array, and a string turns into a string, and the other ones turn into other ones that are equivalent. Um, and so finally, something can speak the language that we need to use. Um, because, because with that, now, now we actually can turn something, oh, hang on, oh, oh. Oh, you can, oh, anyway, if you didn't finish reading it, it's hilarious. Um, so, so now we have something like this, and um, the, the, the JSON parser will turn it into NSRA and NS dictionaries. Um, and each Twitter status is, is um, accessible by using the text object um, in, that, in that dictionary. So in something like this, using that Twitter array that we've made, um, we can access an individual element and say, say the first element and go object for key text and it will provide the string that the person has put in on their Twitter. And with that, I will go to another demo. Um, hopefully, that's just going to do it again, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Sweet. Tony's going to be so mad. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Do, do, do. That'll probably take less time, I'm pretty sure. Okay, cool. So we're back to back to our app again. And next thing we're gonna do is um, figure out how to turn that gobbledygook into something that we can read. So we're gonna go into um, into our network layer here again. And we're gonna import a class that comes with the AF networking files there. Um, and it is there. Um, should have probably clicked on that. Oh well. Um, and we're going to import that straight into our into our network thing. And that is the AF JSON request operation. It defines a set of rules so that AF networking can automatically figure out, hey, you want to get something in JSON? I know how to speak JSON. I'll do that for you. Um, and then we're going to include a little bit of code that that does uh, that that lets your network network layer know how to do that as well. So. Um, we're going to override the init with base URL uh, method and insert um, register HTTP operation class, which says this class exists, it knows what it's doing, use this. Um, and set a default header to accept JSON um, packets, or to accept JSON uh, HTTP responses. Thank you. Um, cool. Awesome. That was hardly worth turning on mirror displays for. Oh, I should probably show you that it does what it's supposed to. What? It's like so many inceptions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give Tony three files and he's going to love it. Um, okay, cool. So we're just going to run that again uh, really quickly so you can see. Sweet. Okay, just. Awesome. So now you note that it's decoded all the JSON into something that NS log speaks, which is all the NS dictionaries. And you can see that there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Each of those tweets is a dictionary in an array. Cool. Um, so we'll turn that off again. And there's another demo. So he's going to have four videos. <laughs> this is the part I don't want to do again. So. No? Okay. Yes. Okay, so um, in this, I shouldn't have done that. The next, <laughs> the next demo is like three slides away. Um, so in this, in this context, presentation is, is everything. So as, as uh, all master UX designers need to know that presenting uh, stuff like that is terrible, and I'm going to show you how to do that using a philosophy that I really like. Um, which is basically dress classy, dance cheesy. Um, it's basically, it doesn't matter what you're doing, as long as you look good, it's gonna be great. Um, and so we're gonna do that by, by using a UI table view. Um, and a UI, UI table view needs a couple of things. It needs a data source, and um, it needs two delegate methods in order to get it to work. Um, and funnily enough, we made a data source earlier on, um, so that, that array that we created in the demo um, will serve as our data source for this table. Um, and the two delegate methods look a little bit like this. So one of them is table view number of rows in section, which tells it how many rows it should actually create. 
And the second one is self rowed index path, which uh, creates a cell and passes that back to the table view to display for each, each, uh, each one of those uh, rows that it has. So here's the other demo slide. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to stop it now. Ah, that was heaps better. Maybe I should do that every time. Cool. I'm getting faster at this. Um, all right, so now we're back in here. What we're going to do is um, we're going to create a UI table view cell, also a UI table view in our storyboard here. So if you haven't used storyboards before, you really are missing out. They are absolutely incredible. Um, and what I'm going to do here, unless you have no screen space, in which they're terrible. Um, <laughs> So we're going to put in a table view here, and that's going to take up all of the screen. And then we're going to drag in a UI table view cell, uh, make it a random, a random length of what you like. And um, then we're going to give it an identifier. So previously, um, before iOS 5, you had to actually create all the cells manually in code. And uh, if you haven't moved over to doing it in IB, it's really, really useful to be able to know how to do it. So I would definitely recommend learning. Um, basically, you just give it a cell identifier, and uh, now we just need to connect it up to a couple of things. So we're going to make an outlet for our table view by dragging it over, calling it tweet table view. Um, and the next thing we're going to do uh, not that one, is we're going to make the uh, the table view, or tell tell the table view rather that the um, the data source exists. Well, this, this view controller should be used as the data source. So um, say, hey, in here are the two methods that you need in order to fill your table with data. So we do that, all good. Um, if you compile it now, it'll complain that those two methods aren't implemented. So that should probably be the next thing that we do. So if I just pop them at the bottom of this file here. Cool. So just a rundown of what those ones do. The first one there, number of rows in section, just check to see how, how many tweets are in that array. Um, we cr even, and th this is all about, uh, this is one of the things that, that REST teaches you as well. There's not going to be any data, oh, sorry, not what asynchronous um, uh, design patterns teaches you, not REST. Um, there's not going to be any data in the app when you first start off, so you need to plan for that. You need to make sure that your, your UI isn't just sitting there um, frozen because the user will think that it's crashed or something's gone wrong. So you need to plan for something to happen um, or, so, or the, the app to still function even if there's no data. So um, this, this before when I created the tweet array into an empty array, that means that it's not gonna, it's not gonna crash or anything when there's no data in that thing. It's just gonna return zero and the table is just gonna sit there. Um, if you were a good UX person, you would put a, a spinner or something in there, um, but I'm not, so oh well. Um, so the next one, next one there uses um, self row at index path and uh, takes that cell identifier that we created in, uh, in IB, and uh, we, we say, hey, wh what I want you to do is, as a cell that exists with this identifier, just make a whole bunch of those cells and use them. So it'll try and DQ one from the table view um, with, with that name, and if it finds one, it, if there's not one there, it'll make one, and it'll reuse all of them um, until, until it's run out. Um, and then what we're gonna do is set the, the, the text label for that cell, um, to be the text of that uh, of the specific tweet that it's asking for. So that sorry, that delegate gets called once for every time for every rec every NS dictionary that's in that array, and we're just going to pull out the, the text of that uh, of that thing there and pop it into the into the cell that we've created. And of course, the last thing we're going to do is refresh the table view. And now, if you were doing this with NS URL connection, you would have to do it. In, uh, and you had multiple types of requests inside your view controller, you would in, in um, did finish loading, what you would have to do is um, say, if this request asked for this, then update this thing on my screen. But because we're using blocks, we do this at the time we actually make the call. So what we're going to do is um, up, refresh this, uh, this, net, this uh, data model um, back up when we actually call the thing. So. That means that when it's finished, it's actually just going to refresh our, our table view um, straight up. So we run that, and with any luck, you're going to see a whole bunch of random tweets that have no control over. Yes. So, um, <laughs> so I uh, was hoping there'd be something more offensive in here, but no. Um, 
Cool, so that's a whole bunch of tweets. Um, that's basically a really terrible Twitter application. Don't ship that um, in, in about 20 minutes. And that now has a network layer that lets you add extra things onto it. So to make a, a thing that checks mentions, all you have to do is create another one of those new methods, say get, me uh, get mentions, find the URI for the mentions, and um, then you can call that from anywhere in your code base. So that's really cool and really extensible. Um, so we'll do that. Start another screen recording. <laughs> I'm really, really good at not, not figuring out where I am. Oh, he's going to love it, yeah. He's also going to love my voice. Um, cool. Awesome. Okay. So um, now we have, um, now we've got our data and we've processed and displayed the whole thing. So that's pretty much how you make API calls um, in elevators. So um, yeah, that, that was a pretty easy thing. All, uh, just step by step, we've gone through how to create, how to create a really crappy Twitter application. Um, I've got a few final words before, before I go. Um, hopefully you remember some of the talk before now. Um, so when I mentioned that there are lots and lots of different types of, um, of uh, things that connect and that, do, that handle this for you, shop around, have a look. You don't necessarily have to use this one. This one's a really easy and nice one to use, but there's a whole bunch of different ones that you can use. So um, find one that suits what you want. Maybe one has different handling for OAuth or different handling for other things that, that is, is quite nice. So have a bit of a look around and um, have a look at the tutorials and examples because Usually, the people who make stuff really want you to use it. So they give really, you really good tutorials on how to do stuff. They give you example code on how to do stuff. Um, it's not always the case, but that's uh, definitely worth looking out for. Um, and then I have three slides. I had no idea where to put them in my, in my uh, thing, so I put them in anyway. Um, you can go on a holiday after you've made your app. You've made lots and lots of money. Um, or blown up Gotham, either one. Um, you can go on an elevator if you're Bane as well. Um, which is incredible. Um, or you could play, play some computer games um, with all the money you've made from your app. So, um, so really, that's the end of my talk. Uh, if you want to contact me, you can find me on Twitter at that, on Facebook on that, or depending on whether you're going to spam me or not, uh, one of those email addresses, you can decide which. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that's my talk. Thank you very much. And now I've got uh, a few minutes for questions, if anyone has questions. Yes? Uh, I haven't. Is there an issue with iOS 6? I haven't done anything that uh, requires iOS 6 yet. I tend to steer away for the first six months until, <laughs> until, until stuff works. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it probably works. Uh, I, I couldn't see why not, but there was nothing on the, the site that I checked to, to say anything different. But. How difficult is it to get authentication with um, So my talk last year was on OAuth. Um, so you're talking about that sort of yeah. that sort of authentication. Um, if if you can get something that handles it for you, really easy. If you have to do it yourself, it's horrific, um, because. OAuth is this giant behemoth that makes you dance and do terrible things. So um, usually what I say, just, just like with this, find something that does it for you, because I guarantee you someone's had that problem before, before you have. Um, and it can make it very easy to, to put auth in stuff. And, and usually uh, once you set up, you do the auth thing once, you insert a token into your network layer, and your network layer figures out when that token needs to be sent and when it doesn't, um, and then automatically attaches it to things that needs to be. Cool. All right. Um, well, I'll be around. I think people need to move out of this room anyway when they, they start doing stuff. So I'll be around at the dinner tonight. If you have any more questions, let me know. And thank you very much.